Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of the Star City Culture Committee. Um, we've got a very good, very good guest here today. Um, it's not a good episode to listen to if you're hungry, so you better get some food going. You know why, Jenna? Why is that? It's because we're talking to Angela Garbitz today from Goldenrod Pastries. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Are you, is your, are you getting hungry over there? Yes. I am. Um, she was called one of the most innovative women in food and drink by Food and Wine. She's been featured in Forbes, Tasting Table, Food Republic, Martha Stewart Living, New York Magazine, and more. And she's based right here in Lincoln. Mm. Um, and so... Without further ado, we'll let Angela say everything more eloquently than I just said. Let's get into it. We're here with Angela Garbitz. How's it going, Angela? Good. It's great to be here with you guys. I'm excited. Awesome. We are too. Um, well, do you want to start out by just giving us a little bit of background about yourself and um, what you've been up to recently? Yeah, for sure. So um, I own Goldenrod Pastries here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I opened that in 2015. And before the business actually started as a blog. And I mean, to keep the story really short, I'll just start there. And um, I started it as a, a blog so I could kind of chronicle my journey with dairy free baking. And I was working at a job that was not like too, super like creatively satisfying. And so the blog was a way for me to really satisfy, you know, the 15 years of baking background that I had and what I really loved to do. And then I opened Goldenrod a year after the blog started. And so now I have two locations. One is at 40th and Prescott in the Union College area. And I have another location in the Bay. So we're really close to campus. And that's more of like a coffee shop vibe. And we focus on lots of pastries, coffee, all of that good stuff um, focus a lot on women empowerment in the food industry specifically and in general. And um, uh, almost exactly six months ago, I launched my, published my first cookbook, Perfectly Golden. Um, so 2020 has been a really big year. So the new location opened in March, the book launched in April, and it's just been like COVID small business craziness since then. Nice. Yeah, that's so much to dive into already well, yeah <laughs> let's was that start. always kind of your goal with um with the blog is to eventually open a store or was that just kind of what happened so my goal always my entire life was to open a store and um so the blog was actually just an opportunity it wasn't really a planned sort of anything i was just at a job that i wasn't feeling super awesome in i was working in international marketing um, at a biotechnology company and you know that like was my dream job too because i got to travel around the world for like somebody else was paying me to travel around the world and so at the time i was like you know this is great i should really just like keep doing this but i had been working in kitchens since i was 15 i'd been baking since i was you know i don't even know and i had been wanting a bakery my own bakery since I was, you know, six years old. And so it's what I knew I always wanted to do. And my plan with, you know, I went to UNL, I got my degrees, my, <laughs> my cat is running across the counter. Um, I don't know if you saw that. Um, but, and if anybody's just listening to this, my cat is running across my counter at home. I am not at the bakery right now. It is Monday <laughs> night. I don't want anybody to think I have cats running across the bakery <laughs> counter. Um, but anyway, I had just always planned on having a bakery and I didn't really know what that was going to look like. But when I started the blog, it was just a great place to share my stories, share um, my journey of dairy-free baking for myself and what I realized when I started that blog and just started putting it on social media was there was a whole group of people who um, needed like gluten-free, vegan, all of these different kinds of food. And um, so I realized that there was like a huge hole in the market. And so I knew that I had to kind of like strike while the iron was hot 
And if I didn't open this bakery, start this business, then somebody else would. So it was very organic. I didn't really like plan on it very much. If you go far enough back, like six years back on the Goldenrod Pastries Instagram, it's just like my personal Instagram. And it's like just my dogs and my husband. And then one day I was like, oh, I think this is actually like a business. So I guess I should choose a name. <laughs> and that's... um it's so weird, like how it really just evolved so much through social media and just organically that way. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so how did you end up uh, writing a cookbook then? Well, that is also something that I always wanted to do. And so I started focusing more on a national platform for um, media outreach and um, projects that I was working on bec about three years ago. So that with like the end goal of having a book. So the bakery had been open for like a year and a half or two years. And I was like, all right, we're like really doing a great job. I have a great team. And I know that a book is the next step and it takes a really long time to get a book um, and get a book deal and not pay to have it published yourself. And so I just started working on outreach for that and um, trying to get some bigger um, media placements. So we were getting on national, a lot of national attention um, in, I think it was 2017. Was that food and wine wrestle? My husband's like, I don't know. <laughs> um, 2017, so food and wine is a really big national um, publication and they, I got an email one night saying that they had named me one of their most innovative women in food and drink. And there were like not very many women on that list. And I at first thought it was a scam and I was just going to delete it. And then I realized that like, oh, actually all of this hard work is like paying off. And I always tell people it's like a long game. And so I wanted to have this book but like before you do that, you have to have the business. And before you do that, you have to have a plan. Before you have to do that, you have to have the experience. And so like really all of this has been, you know, in the works for like, you know, a decade. And it's not something that happens overnight. So the book really is part of that like long game plan. And so once I started getting more national attention, I was able to find a literary agent. And once you find an agent, then you do, um, work on a, a proposal and find a publisher and I guess I started I mean it was like start to finish from the time I got an agent like two and a half years Oh wow! and I think like yeah it's a very very like long process so um I always <laughs> like to kind of put that in perspective for people it's not something that happens overnight and it's not something that happens really easily and um you know, nobody writes cookbooks except for like, you know, 0.5% of the people who do it. You don't do it to like make money. You do it because it's like such a great like reputation builder and also mm. to be able to tell the stories of my business and my family and to share recipes and specifically um, recipes that are accessible for a lot of people, no matter how they eat. Um, is really important and the recipes are very like financially accessible as well and so i it was just kind of like a part of building the brand yeah that's really cool that's um i was flipping through the book uh earlier today and something that really stuck out to me was that um all of it was very like personal and very inviting and i i guess i haven't read a lot of cookbooks to be honest but it yeah. seemed like you were really like trying to connect with other people and like, I think go ahead I think that's always like important to do and especially with food it's such a personal thing and for me like food is um, my life and it's what I do and it's what you know I do this because I'm passionate and I do this because it's the one thing the one thing I've wanted to do my entire life and so connecting with people and being able to create a dialogue with people through um, my recipes and through my experiences and through my family's history and my own history was really important. And, you know, sitting down and starting the process of writing the book was really challenging, even though, you know, like I said, it's the like plan, it's the long game, it's this whole thing. 
it's hard to know what you want to say. And so I really had to start thinking about like, what does food mean to me? What, ha what role has it played in my life? And who are the people who have had roles in this journey? And kind of defining that journey and um, telling that story was, it was really a very introspective experience when I just kind of thought I was going to sit down and write recipes. It really became um, a hugely like transformative personal experience for me which not all cookbooks are like I'm looking at a bunch of my cookbooks right now and a lot of them really are just recipes and like the head notes above the recipes will really just be like I made this with this person and here is this recipe and I hope you really like it and there's nothing wrong with that but I really wanted to like I wanted to write the book and the techniques and the stories in a way that would really connect with people and you know I was talking about um, women empowerment female empowerment and I went through a lot of like bullying and really unfortunate situations working in the food industry and with other women and with men and with, you know, just not really great experiences. And so I want to be uh, people to be able to pick up this book who have been in those same situations. And if the one thing you get out of this book is not a recipe at all, but that like you can find a place where you fit in, then that's like worth it to me. And so you know, people pick up a book for a lot of different reasons, especially a cookbook. You're looking at the art, you're looking at the recipes, you're looking at the story. And so like, if somebody can take, if a young woman can take one thing from this book, it's that like, don't settle for people treating you like shit. Like there will be people who will treat you better and people who will invite you into their world and um, treat you well. And I think that's really important. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, how did you go about choosing like which recipes were going to go in the book? Um, well, I put some favorites from the bakery um, and like bun recipes, like our morning buns are super popular at the store. So I knew I had to include those. And then I just tried to really like sit back and think about the recipes that I really love that I ate growing up and the, the memories that I had associated with them. So I wanted to include, um, like for example, there's a really cool recipe that it's called turtle cookies. It's my mom, one of my mom's recipes. I'll find a picture of it while I'm talking. And um, I love this recipe because it's really delicious it's a chocolate cookie it's basically a brownie uh, batter and then you put it in a waffle iron to bake it instead of putting it in the oven and so it has a really unique look and then it gets um, peanut butter frosting but I wanted to do like it's just like so cool looking <laughs> and I really love it and so you know recipes with a story like my grandma's peach coffee cake was like something that it was one of the last things that she taught me to make um, before she wasn't baking very much anymore. And then it was also um, the last thing that she ate before she died. And so um, I wanted to make sure to include recipes that told the story of me and my journey. So it's, it's a really fun book. Like there's a whole snack cake chapter and snack cakes like became a thing to me when I was working in my job, my desk job. And I needed like motivation to get through the day. So I would like make cake for myself and like portion it out for like, okay, if you can make it till 1030, then you get this cake. If you can make it until one o'clock, then you can get this like cake in this container. And if you can make it till four o'clock, then there's this cake for you. And so like, I just like motivated myself throughout the day with cake and like every day and all week. <laughs> every <laughs> week. It's genius. That's so funny. I am motivated by food. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, like you were saying, you wanted to kind of capture the journey you've been on with food. And you, did you say that you knew you wanted to be a baker by the time you were six years old? Yeah, I mean, it's the, so like the Food Network um, came out like when I was five or six in like the beginning of the 90s and it was like the most I never watched cartoons I never watched any like kids shows I only watched food tv and it's the only thing I wanted to do it was the only way that I wanted to spend my time it was the only 
the complete and only thing that I have ever wanted to do. And, um, you know, when I was trying to decide if I should quit my job and start the bakery, like I knew that it's one what I wanted to do, but like I gave them six weeks notice and up until the last week or the last couple of days, I was like, is this crazy? Um, and it was, but, um, somebody told me once that if you feel this sounds like kind of silly, but they said, if you feel like you're going to spontaneously combust, if you don't do something, then you should do it. And like, mm -hmm. it's a little dramatic, but I knew that I at least had to try. And, um, I'm almost 35, I guess. And to ha want to do something for 30 years and never get sick of it is pretty cool. Yeah. That's really amazing to me. What was it about food and baking that captured your attention from such a young age? Um, it's very tangible. It's very tactile. I love the way it feels. I love the way it smells. I mean, that's the way that my family spent our time together. So um, me and my siblings would make cookies in the evening. Like my mom, I write about this in the book too, that like food was never praised or feared. It was never something that was like, you can only have this many cookies. You can only have, it was like, okay, cool. If you want to have cake for breakfast, that's totally fine. Like it was like, my mom always and still says like sugar, she thinks sugar is a vegetable because it comes from beets and those that's grown in the ground so it's obviously healthy but it was just something that was like always a very like happy memory for me and you know I don't do meditation in a traditional sense um I mean, I'm a very like wound up person in general but when I bake and when I'm in the kitchen I don't think about anything else. Like I completely like, unless I'm at work and I'm, you know, managing a dozen people and two stores. Um, so obviously I'm thinking about what's going on, but in general, like when I'm in the kitchen, I am have a complete sense of calm and it's the only thing that has ever made me feel that way. So you actually went on to study in New York, right? I did. Yeah. That's where I went to pastry school. So cool. Yeah. Um, it seems like you're pretty um, successful and you've gotten a lot of attention from baking. So um, why do you, well, first of all, would you like want to stay um, in LinkedIn long term with this? And then uh, why LinkedIn? So um, I am from Lincoln. I love to go to, this is Sally, my golden retriever. She's also motivated like <laughs> yeah. by food. She's also motivated by food like I am. Um, but, okay, so I went to UNL. I went to New York for pastry school, which was like, you know, my dream. And I had job offers to stay there. I worked my ass off when I was there. I went to school from like seven to three every day. And then I did one of two internships every day after school. One of them was from like 3.30 until like midnight. And one of them was from like four until one or 2 a.m. And then I would be back at school the next day. And I knew that like, I had to make the most of my time there because once school was over, I wouldn't be able to afford to stay there any longer because it's so hard to make a living in, in food. And so ultimately I couldn't stay because I couldn't afford it. And like the food industry, and so that was in 2008, the food industry is still a really challenging field, but you know, you, there's no way to live a life of any sort uh, with any sort of real freedom in New York, unless you have money to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I came back and I had a job offer like maybe in 2010 or 2009 and it was to run education at a cheese shop and that was like the best like financial job offer that I had had in food so far and so I was like maybe I'm gonna do this and they actually like offered me the job over the phone but then they're like you have to come here we're gonna fly you here to meet the owner he wants to meet you before everything's finalized and I was like okay cool and so I went out there and he was awful, first of all, but he, one of the worst things about it, the most memorable thing is that he said, how do you think you're going to be able to do this job? What do you, 
how do you think that somebody from Nebraska is going to be able to stand up in front of a room of New Yorkers and be able to hold your own and be able to handle a room full of New Yorkers? And I was so pissed (laughs) because, you know, I'm born and raised in Nebraska. I have had the honor of meeting a lot of people from many different backgrounds from all over the world. I have, um, at that point, even, you know, over a decade ago, I had had some really incredible experiences with incredible people from everywhere. And for him to think that people all over the world, or that, that people from Nebraska, where I was from, were so different that I wouldn't know how to interact with people from New York was the most insulting thing that I had, well, I've been, I had at that point been treated pretty shitty in the food industry, Um, but it was such an outright insult. I Mm -hmm. got on that plane that afternoon and at that point I, they still thought I had accepted the job. And when I landed in Omaha, I had never been so relieved to be home. And I think that there's something, there are a lot of really special things about Nebraska, but I knew that this is where I wanted to be. And this Mm -hmm. is where my family is. And one really wonderful thing about Nebraska is, and where we're from, is that you never know who you're going to run into. And you never know, like, what background somebody's from, for the most part, and, like, what they've done and who they are. And it doesn't really matter because it's more about getting to know the person. And it's not about, like, this person is from this family and this person did this and they lived in this part of New York or whatever. And... You know, I think that that just really put everything in perspective for me. And I knew that I didn't ever want that for myself. And I wanted to go back to a place and be in a place where that kind of status didn't matter. And I think that there is that here to a certain extent. But what, but I just love being here. This is my home. And that to me, was so was such an example of a bigger problem and so I love being here I knew that um more like focused and logistically speaking I knew that I could afford to open my business here um Lincoln is a great place to have a small business it's very affordable um the Lincoln community is also incredibly supportive of small businesses I think even more than other places in Nebraska and I mean I've been so lucky to be incredibly successful here so far um, 2020 is a trip, but, um, I love it here and I love the people that I work with and I love being able to see my parents and I love, um, being able to have dogs and, um, space and big skies. And I, I think it's important to invest in the place that you're from. Awesome. Um, that seems it reminds me a lot of uh like what the bay does so um it's really cool to see how goldenrod and the bay paired up together um can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be and how it's going um well so i opened that location march 9th 2020 um and so I wouldn't have recommended to anyone to open then, (laughs) Um, but the Bay is a super cool place and they had been running a coffee shop out of their like giant warehouse space in between their offices and their skate park for about three years. And they just, they have so many projects going on. They realized that working on a coffee bar wasn't really the best use of their time or like how they like wanted to use their resources. And, um, if you want to be in food in any way, you really have to like, A, know what you're doing and B, like choose to be very focused on it. And so um, I was at a point with my team where I have like a really good core um, management team and I wanted to be able to give them more responsibility and, you know, more money. And so the only way you can really do that is to expand and to grow. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't turned out exactly the way that we had planned. Um, because of COVID, Mm -hmm. um, because of, I mean, that location is such a destination. Like you don't just like drive, like drive by there. Um, but I think 
what's really, really cool from all of it is to see that, you know, Goldenrod is still doing great in a time when a lot of my friends in the food industry around the country are not doing well. Goldenrod as a whole is doing really, really great. And I think that that's very inspiring to me, both as a business owner and as a Lincolnite, that the community is still supporting small business. And I feel very grateful. I feel very lucky. Um, it's been a tough go at the Bay so far um, because, I mean, everything's shut down there. There's no skate school. There's no activities. It's hard to really find a way to do safe um, engagement activities with the public right now. But I'm very inspired by having a business right now in Lincoln specifically. And I always tell my staff that the most important thing with, because the government, I mean, to get a little bit political, um, I know you guys are doing the journalism thing, so you can't really comment on it, but the government is doing nothing for small business and they're doing nothing for um, working people. And so I always tell my team the most important thing that I can do for them is to keep them employed and to keep them paid because the government will not help them. Mm -hmm. They will not help us, um, unfortunately. And so the most important thing to do is to stay safe and to stay healthy, follow the CDC guidelines for what that means, and we can stay working um, through throughout COVID. I know that's like a bigger answer to what you asked, but Mm -hmm. I'm very, very passionate about like workers' rights and um, keeping my staff as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. And your staff, um, it's completely uh, women. The whole bakery is woman run, right? It is all women, women identifying people right now. Um, we've had a few um, guys with us, um, so non female identifying, um, but right now it's all back to ladies. Mm -hmm. which like I was talking about a little bit earlier the one notable thing about that is not just that it's um woman identifying people it's that it is hopefully setting a, a positive example for um women working well together and that is not something that I had always seen that is not something that was always um offered to me and so I wanted to make sure I woke up one day and realized I was working with all ladies and I was like oh man this is actually really cool because I feel really good when I leave work and I feel really excited to go to work and it's not about competition it's not about who's at the top it's about like just supporting each other in this really unique environment. Is that something you set out to do um, when you started your business? No it's not I um, started my business as the only employee <laughs> um, and so, which was crazy, um, because I had no money. I opened with $700 left in my, from my bank loan. And so I had no money to pay staff and didn't want to have them <laughs> because I didn't know how, um, and how do you pay people? I didn't know. And so, um, all of a sudden I just, I honestly realized one day I was like, oh my God, these, this is all ladies. This like literally just realized one day I was like, this is so cool. And, um, like I said before, realized that it was a really like empowering, awesome environment and not an experience that I had had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really neat. Um, uh, Okay. Time out, just to FYI, I don't know if you guys can see, but we have about eight minutes left in this meeting. Um, okay. So we can just do a couple more questions and then wrap it up from there, if that sounds good. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, Jenna, I didn't mean to interrupt if you had anything. Oh, no, no, I was done okay. talking. You're good. Um, let's see. Um, I've what train of thought were we on? I'm sorry. Uh, you, women. Oh, yeah. I would just <laughs> ask if you could talk about your um, virtual baking lessons that you're putting on. For sure. So um, the COVID era has brought us a lot of new opportunities. I always like to find a positive spin. And um, so we've, I've always had people ask if we could do virtual or do baking classes in the store 
um, the store, and that's one thing that we wanted to do with the with the Bay location, but just doesn't make a lot of sense to do in-person baking classes right now. And so when the book came out, um, I started doing a lot of IG lives, just kind of promoting the book and doing baking uh, classes out of my home kitchen and realized that it was actually pretty cool to do it virtually. And so we started offering virtual baking classes. Um, the first round was in July and we bake from, um, I'll just plug it again from my book, Perfectly Golden. I know it's backwards. Um, but like, for example, we did one last week that was like a build your own bun class. So I taught like the traditional bun dough recipe and I taught our gluten-free bun dough recipe and then um, a bun recipe for each of the different doughs. And then everybody gets the recipe. They get um, all the FAQ answered from the class and yeah, it's great. So you can do the class on its own. You can do the, you can add a copy of the book to the class and it's just over zoom. It's super fun. Um, so we're doing, we did the buns one last week, this week, I think is like a uh, pound cake and donuts. Next week we do cookies. And then in November we do a special pie edition class. And so it's super fun because people can engage from all over the country we have a ton of people tuning in from um, the coasts and longtime customers. So it's a really cool way to get in, to do classes. And it's something that I had always wanted to do, but it was just really hard to envision how it would fit into the actual bakery, physical bakery itself. And so doing them virtually has been a really cool thing. So like, I mean, also like launched a book during COVID, I had a whole like book tour planned and couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's been really cool is people have really learned how to um, transition to virtual settings. And I think that we're going to see a lot of really cool, um, I don't know, opportunities coming from that. So yeah, you can sign up for our virtual baking classes. I should tell people that <laughs> at shopgoldenrad.com. It's a great gift to give people. They're 25 bucks um, without the bu book. It's an hour on Thursday, after, like right after like dinner time. And it's a great gift. We're offering scholarships as well. No questions asked. If you um, need a scholarship, you can email us. And that all that information is at shopgoldenrod.com. Nice. Um, I got maybe one more question here. Uh, sure. What do you kind of see as uh, like the end goal for goldenrod pastries? Is there one? Well, Mark, I just don't even know because it's only been five and a half years. So I can't even imagine what's next. Another book, I'm sure. Um, the funny thing that I think about business is like, you see so many people who are all about like, grow, 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 build more, do more. And I don't necessarily think that that's the answer to a um, great business. I think you can totally do that. Um, but I think there's also a lot of value in making a bigger impact on your small on a smaller community as opposed to making a smaller impact on a larger group of people. So um, whenever I get the itch to do something bigger or more, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And I'm all about it. I always think about like getting to actually be in my stores on a rate, like all of the time I have been, I have baked every Saturday morning at the store, like say for a few Saturdays that I've traveled for five and a half years. And I get to see the same people getting the same thing. And the joy that that brings me is incredible. So I would rather keep doing that and loving what I'm doing and expand through, you know, virtual activities and um, more books. Um, I also have a um, Women's History Month campaign called um, Empower Through Flower. And I'm on my third year of that. And I work with, you know, like 150 different um, female chefs and influencers and restaurateurs um, around the country for that. And we raise money for a nonprofit called I Am That Girl that helps to promote women's equality around the world. And so that's a great way to grow and make a difference. Um, and so I guess just more of that, more books, more buns, 
more babes. I don't know. <laughs> I love what I love my store. I love what I do. And if I could just keep doing it the same way that I'm doing it now until I can't do it anymore, that would be fine with me. Nice. Well, that's quite literally all the time we have. So <laughs> I think we can wrap it up here. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. This was really fun. Um, any last final thoughts or anything? Come see us at the bakery and stay safe out there. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank okay. you again. Thank so you. Nice to meet Thanks. You. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you too. You. All right. Bye. Yeah.